Perhaps no other asset class was impacted as much over the last 12 months by both cyclical and structural changes than commercial real estate. But what lies ahead for 2024? Will higher interest rates continue to bite? Will valuations come more into focus? And might we even see the very definition of core real estate evolve? Welcome to the Bearings 2024 Global Real Estate Outlook, where our experts across the US, Europe, and Asia Pacific will weigh in on the prospects for real estate debt and equity markets for 2024. This episode is part of our 2024 Outlook series, which in addition to this episode, includes conversations on public fixed income and direct lending. You can follow along on our streaming income podcast feed our YouTube channel, or by visiting bearings.com, where we'll be posting audio, video, and written versions of these conversations. With that, here is Bearings' Maureen Joyce to kick off the discussion. Hi, we're thrilled to host so many of you from around the globe for our 2024 Outlook. I know it will be both informative and an interesting discussion for you. My name is Maureen Joyce. I'm the head of U.S. Real Estate Asset Management and Equity Portfolio Management. I'm really excited to be your host today and moderator for today's roundtable discussion with my colleagues, John Ackerblum, Nick Pink, and Alistair Wright. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to dive into the outlook for global real estate markets as we head into 2024. This year, the theme of our outlook is coming into focus. From higher rates and persistent inflation although there has been some recent good news on the inflation front, but to also mounting geopolitical tensions around the globe, there's no shortage of uncertainty as we look toward the year ahead. But at the end of the day, real estate is a local business. The best investors are making decisions not only by assessing top-down influences, but largely by focusing on bottom-up circumstances and considerations. As such, our group today will bring into focus the key themes, risk, and opportunities that they're thinking about for the year ahead, based on what each of them is seeing on the ground in their markets. Our goal is to give you a window in how the team is making investment decisions in the hopes that we might be able to provide some clarity and help you inform your views and decisions heading into 2024. With that, I want to start with introductions. I'd like each of my colleagues to briefly introduce themselves. I'd also like them to share an interesting book or podcast with you. Um, I'm going to start here in the States and ask John Ackerblum to introduce himself. My name is John Ackerblum. I'm the head of U.S. real estate uh, for Bearings. I would say an interesting podcast is Streaming Income from Bearings. That's one. Uh, if you need one other one, I'm a big fan of a podcast called Criminal, which is exactly the opposite and focuses on uh, notorious crimes produced here in the state of North Carolina where where I am based and where Charlotte, where Bearings is based. And from a book standpoint, I'm reading American Prometheus, which is the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer and the book on which the film Oppenheimer was made. And Nick, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. So I'm Nick Pink. I'm head of Real Estate Europe. John and Al's opposite number over here. I think, actually, I probably qualify as the Bearings vet on this panel. Having been been part of the platform since 2010 and, and building out the business in in equity and debt real estate, and today we have a you know we've got a big vertically integrated team of around 70 real estate professionals across Europe. Because I'm the vet, I'm actually not very much into podcasts. I have to say, um, so I'm going to focus on book, and I'm probably going to bring the tone down and say that for me, a bit of gratuitous escapism is is really what I need, particularly in markets like we're we're currently in the midst of. And my go-to at the moment, and probably for for a lot of a lot of time, is is actually Lee Charles and Jack Reacher, the Jack Reacher series, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Which is uh, you know majorly formulaic, but I mean that's probably what you need right now. So, and and to, to, to sort of indicate how formulaic that is, I thought I was starting the new 29th book a couple of weeks ago, and I probably got about 20 chapters in before I realised I was actually rereading the ninth book in the series. And Al, please introduce yourself and let us know what you're up to from a reading or listening standpoint. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, my name's Alistair Wright. I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Um, I'm the newbie, having been with uh, Bearings now for just over, over a year. In terms of 
book. I'm, I'm actually reading a book called Outlive by Dr. Peter Adia, and it's all about living a long and healthy life. Also, importantly, it's about being proactive about your health rather than just reactive. And I think that's something that we can apply in our in our working life as well as our 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 health. Thanks so much. I'm going to insert myself here and recommend a book that I just finished called Horse by Geraldine Brooks. It's beautifully written. It's so interesting. It's an intricate story. That horse, that central figure connects human characters. There's a lot more to the story. I'll leave it there and let you all take advantage of reading the book yourself. So now I'm going to kick off today's discussion. But in keeping with our theme of coming into focus, there is a lot of focus or seeming consensus that we're in a period of prolonged, higher for longer rate environment, something that wasn't a consensus even a year ago. What are you all seeing in terms of the impact of higher rates in your regions, including less obvious places? And how are you shifting your thesis based on the idea of higher for longer? John, can I start with you? Sure. So I am a higher for longer believer, and I'm also of the mind that this is not bad news for the real estate market, that higher for longer, uh, a mid-range treasury rate in the 4% range or thereabouts, I think is indicative of stability and much more consistent with our long, with a, with a long range uh, average. Uh, and I think it can be a positive. Where we're seeing the impact of interest rates, I think these these places will be consistent across the globe, but a handful of places. Number one, transaction volume is meaningfully reduced. The shock to the system of the doubling of the risk-free rate has created a wide bid-ask spread around assets, and that has led to stasis. That's been coupled with lenders' willingness to accommodate borrowers, at least in the near term. And all of that has conspired to make a transaction pipeline that's pretty small relative to historical norms, maybe 60% down from uh, averages over the last uh, several years. Um, secondly, valuation. You know, valuations, when you double the risk-free rate, all risk asset classes need to adjust in, in value, all else held equal. And we're seeing that play out uh, in the private market as well as the public market for real estate um, in the United States. From a positive standpoint, uh, one place is uh, that we're uh, seeing the impact of rates is I think we're finally seeing uh, some nominal cooling on material cost and maybe even to some extent labor um, for uh, development and redevelopment activity. It still isn't where we need it to be and prices are still very high, but we're starting to see uh, some impact from uh, the Fed's activity. Thanks, John. Ned. What are you saying and what's the impact of rates on your markets and your investment thesis? Yeah, I mean, just before I sort of tackle that point, maybe just going back to your opener, yeah, clearly they're higher relative to where they were in 21 and for a long period before that. And as John says, that wasn't normal. You know, we're heading back to a, a, a new equilibrium, which is going to look a lot more like probably the interest rate environment, you know, we all started our careers in. So. So that is for sure. Longer, yes. But I think, you know, what, what does longer look like? Well, that's in flux week by week, day by day at the moment as, as, as we sort of grapple with the latest leading indicators that, that, that come through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, clearly, the US is driving um, monetary policy as the global reserve currency. So whatever we do over here, you know, we have half an eye on what's going on um, with the Fed. But in Europe, we're we're in a slightly different place. Um, you know, we've taken some 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 pretty hard medicine, and growth has pretty much ground to a halt. Uh, and inflation has dropped back towards target in in most jurisdictions as well. So, so I think you know, and even in the UK, which has probably had the stickiest inflation, we've seen some 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 pretty dramatic falls recently. So I think rates are set to ease. Um, you know, certainly into the second half of twenty twenty four. Um, you know, especially especially if it does look like some of that medicine has maybe been a little bit too too late and too strong ultimately. So for us, in terms of what does it mean? Yes, same as John. You know, volumes are down, valuations are adjusting, and near term in terms of what we're doing, well, it's it's really been that shift away from equity towards debt, where the ruby price has, has obviously happened a lot more quickly. I think latterly we're beginning to see a shift back a little bit towards equity strategies, certainly in the value add opportunistic space. And at that end of the spectrum, I think um, that, you know, the higher for longer rates, that really sort of bites at refi. So that's where the stress is beginning to come through. And I think that's going to be a key thing for us as we sort of move into, into 2024. And Al, how about down under? 
Yeah, I think, look, it's it's worth acknowledging that there's volatility in the rate outlook and what we think today may change over the next three to six months. So we're focused on strategies that focus on thematics and, and not dependent on, on rates. Having said that, if we do assume a higher for longer scenario, our market being highly institutionalized, they were hoping, I think, that they could hold their assets through this cycle. And as rates came down, the, the valuations would go down, but then come back up. And, and I think there's a realization that that is unlikely to happen. And so we're seeing a bit more propensity for, for those groups to sell assets. And so coming into 2024, I think we'll see more liquidity in the market and that gap between buyers and sellers will narrow. Just the last thing I would say about rates, and I think I speak for all of us, is that this change, this adjustment of valuation, this is going to lead to greater differentiation of outcome. And it is what I it represents what I think of as a stock picker's market in real estate. The quality of your team, the quality of your infrastructure, the ability to to pick assets um, is going to really lead to greater differentiation than we've seen over the past, call it 10 years, when in a raging bull market, lots of boats rise with the tide. And so I'm optimistic about, about our prospects looking forward, regardless of where the rate environment goes from here. So it looks like we all agree that it's higher for longer. You've all mentioned what that means to a certain degree on what will happen with asset valuation. This has been an area that's been quite hazy recently, especially around certain sectors like office, because there's such a big difference between where buyers and sellers are. Should we expect to see more clarity in the year ahead with regard to where values come out? I think in Europe, at least, you know, the valuation shift has really been a feature of the market probably since... I mean, it's something in, in the UK is really since since Q, Q1, Q2, 2022. So, and, you know, the UK is always the most liquid and, and transparent market. So it, it tends to adjust pretty rapidly and then ripple out across the region. And, and that's really what we've seen in this cycle. You know, public market valuations are pointing to, in Europe at least, are pointing to, you know, valuation adjustments when you strip out the leverage impact of something between 20 and 25%. And if we look at what we've had so far in Europe, if you look at the the MSCI indices, for Europe as a whole, they're off about fifteen percent to the mid year. Um, you know, looking at the valuations that are coming in now across our funds for Q3 and looking ahead to Q4, you know, you can easily expect to see. I think the indices push out at that twenty percent sort of lower end of the range by the year end. So I think. Maybe that's a, a long rambling way of saying that maybe Europe's a little bit ahead of the US and, and, and Asia, which which may be given what you know the driver has been here, particularly you know the local conflict, shouldn't be a great surprise, particularly given our reliance on Russian gas and sort of the the export led economies that we have here in Europe. But it hasn't been a uniform picture, that is for sure. So you know it has rippled out from north to south. It's still going on. We've got a couple of quarters left to come. And probably the you know the final thing I'd say is that the, you know the saving grace so far in this adjustment has probably been the strength of the occupational markets over here. So rent value growth indexation as well of course with inflation has really helped mitigate that cap rate impact that we've seen across our markets over the last 18 months. The big concern of course is that the impacts on the economy that we're now seeing with a big slowdown in GDP growth could start to have an impact on demand and growth. So there's a big question mark there. Al, what are you seeing in your markets? It's interesting to hear Nick's observations. I think in our market, the, the valuations tend to be much slower to come through and, and they come through over a longer period of time. So I think we feel we're sort of in the middle of that valuation decline. And that's mainly because our valuers need to see transactional evidence to then value other assets, which I think is a little bit different to some, to certainly the UK market where sentiment plays a, bit, a bigger role in those valuations. So I think over the next six months, we will see those valuations come down and, and our market, our, our institutions often don't want to sell at a low book value. And uh, so the quicker those valuations come down, the, what that will result in is, is more liquidity in the market and, and that liquidity is needed. Valuations coming down, more pressure on debt covenants and the like. And I think 
the result of that will be more transactional activity. I'm going to actually ask a question if I can, Maureen, without stealing your job. The, the and this for Nick, for you and Al, does the, do you sense that the private market has confidence in valuations as they are being reported vis-a-vis the public market? I have an answer for the United States, but I, Al's answer sort of triggered this question for me. Is, is there a, you know, on a one to five with one being most confident, where would you place the investor market's confidence in, in private valuations? Yeah, it's it's a mixed picture. You know, obviously we're operating across multiple jurisdictions with very, very different sort of market practice in terms of, you know, the way they appraise assets. Although, you know, things have probably got a lot closer in this cycle than they have in the past. But, you know, you probably move from the UK, you know, the most liquid, transparent market out there, which is more willing to value on sentiment to Al's earlier point. And certainly in the logistics space, probably in all things residential, there's a reasonable degree of confidence that that appraisals are reasonably approximate with clearing price. And that sort of spreads north to south across Europe as we become a little bit more opaque in the market. But generally speaking, logistics adjusted quickly and and deeply. So I think they're broadly in line with, with where pricing is today. There's a good sense for where the floor is. I think where the big concern stroke question mark comes across Europe is in in the office space because there's been so little price discovery in office of any quality anywhere. And the only activity that you really do see is is probably from the high net worth private wealth sector, which really isn't return seeking. So a lot of the activity there is just taking an opportunity to to park money in locations that are perceived as wealth preserving. So you can't really take that as a real estimate of worth in the current market environment. So office is still a concern everywhere, for sure. Got it. Al, what about in Australia? Is there widespread sort of acceptance that values are reasonable relative to clearing levels, or is there or is yeah, it it's more, interesting. Uh, more of a concern? It's, and again, I'll answer at the end. I'm not just putting you on the spot. Uh, it's a good question. And I, I think our market, there's a real, there's a, everybody sees that the valuations are going to be lower at 31 December than they were at 30 June and and again at 30 June next year. So it's almost an anticipation and nobody wants to catch that falling knife. So we're seeing where we are seeing assets clear is is often at 5 to 5 to 10% below book value particularly in office there is limited activity a little bit and that activity is sort of 10 to 20% below book value. So I, don't, I would say there's not a huge amount of confidence in the current valuations, but a general acceptance that they'll continue to come down, albeit moderating. So for the US, I think it's fair to say that I would call it a crisis of confidence in the private market valuation model, but it's it's a significant concern that values in the private market are not reflective of clearing levels or anything resembling it. I think, like you, it's a process, and appraisals are rearward looking, and they're generally considering arm's length transactions with willing buyers and willing sellers. When you don't have many of those, you either rely on historical information that's more stale, or you conjecture, which it sounds like is sort of the barbells, and it's hard to do that. And so I think that there is some concern that valuations haven't yet adjusted and aren't kind of reasonable in the private market. I think that probably exists more for office than any other asset class. But you know, when you double the risk-free rate, if we all think about our asset classes as requiring some premium to the risk-free rate in order to make them investable, that premium changes when the risk-free rate doubles. So how does that impact value and so forth? Big questions that are playing out over time, but it's an interesting perspective to hear globally how the world's thinking about it. Back to you, Maureen. Sorry to Take your job. No, this, this is what we're trying to do. We want a conversation. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about where you see opportunities. Real estate debt generally seems to be more in favor than real estate equity currently in the United States, at least. And I'd like to understand why you think that is and what opportunity exists in the debt markets. John, can you kick us off on that discussion? Yes. This is the good news section of the podcast for those who are paying attention at home. This is the opportunity that we see in uh, the debt market in the U.S. Debt has been a business that we've been in for many, many years. It's an area that has been a core part of our operation for as long as we've been around. And the market conditions for uh, real estate debt uh, in the United States today are very favorable to lenders. Handful of reasons for that. 
many related to interest rates, some related to transaction volumes. The biggest driver of that is that banks have largely exited the market and banks were a very substantial percentage of the total lending volume, particularly in areas like construction and, and in real estate lending generally. The regional banks were very active. The money center banks were very active. And that activity has largely stopped. And it stopped for reasons other than necessarily big credit challenges in the book. What's happened is l- lenders have not been getting paid back as quickly as they anticipated. And they made loans in anticipation of being paid back. So the example I always give of a large money center bank has a $20 billion book, wants to grow by 10% in 2021, they would make $2 billion worth of loans. But if they expected to get paid back $2 billion, then they'd make $4 billion worth of loans in that year, expecting to get to 22 by year end. They went ahead and made those $2 billion worth of loans, and the $2 billion that they expected to be paid back wasn't paid back as expected. And so now they have a $24 billion book and they're overweight. So that scenario has played itself out very frequently. It's because loans have not been paid voluntarily early, as would have been the case in an ordinary cycle. So borrowers are holding on to the money longer if they are if they borrowed at favorable terms, not paying back as quickly as they otherwise would. So banks don't have capacity. As a result, being a lender in this market is favorable. There are other factors at work, but I would say that combination of spread, ability to secure loans with great sponsors, cash equity, lower advance rates, and better documentation, which is sort of the unsung hero of this uh, cycle, are all more favorably tilted toward banks. By the way, as an owner of equity, which we are also, all of that is challenging for us. So we're confronting it on both sides. But from a debt standpoint, very favorable time to be a lender in the US. Can I just ask a quick question on that, John? Where have you seen the returns and what you can charge essentially for that? How's that moved over over the cycle, given interest rates and, and given the lack of capital or the change in the amount of capital available? Yeah, we've seen spreads cap out 150 to 300 basis points. So thereabouts in some instances, construction lending spreads have uh, widened very materially. But I think that it's the combination of increased spread and enhanced credit quality that are coexisting that makes it such a unique and interesting time. When you have a spread that is gone up and let's just say by 100, 150 basis points, to have that coincide with an advance rate that's gone from 70% to 60% from a sponsor that is a regional sponsor to a national sponsor, very well capitalized, to completion guarantees that are more substantial, to a cash equity requirement that is better, to reps and warranties that are better, covenants, sort of every element of the loan process is tilted in favor of the lender. We want to be respectful of that. We're not here to take advantage of market conditions in, in favor of our customers, but we're able to make very we're able to make selections in terms of the way that the people with whom we do business and the and the types of deals that we finance that are very favorable to us and to our investors. So pretty meaningful. I'm gonna move us along a little bit so to find out what's happening in Europe and Asia Pack. I'll start with Nick. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be brief, but I mean, broadly speaking, the you know the dynamics are, are pretty much the same. I'd say the market structure in Europe is a little bit different, which probably has some positives and negatives. I mean, we're still bank dominated here outside of the UK, at least. You know, on, on the plus side, real estate I think is real estate leverage as a percentage of total bank loan books is is a little bit lower than it was in the previous cycle, and a little bit lower than I think it is in the states. So you know, with with fewer alternative lenders in the market space, and with you know more a more regulated banking sector in this cycle, liquidity, much like in in the US, is really tightly constrained, and and the banks themselves are far more constrained in terms of you know the covenants and the the LTVs they're willing to offer out to the market. So there's definitely an opportunity, but it's a far more Im- immature market, um, and the opportunity is really in those parts of the market where the banks have retreated from. So, you know, whole loans, construction lending, that is where the opportunity, I think, to, to generate some excess returns is in Europe. And Alistair, when I ask you to talk about the debt opportunities, can you also jump into what will be my next question or where do you see opportunities in equity? Because there are some. Yeah, definitely. Um, just finishing off on the debt, our, our market is characterized by four big banks and and there is liquidity in that market. In fact, the margins that we're seeing on the debt that we're procuring for our equity business are, 
the same, if not lower, than what we were seeing a couple of years ago. Uh, so that competition is still there, and there's more capital in the in the non-bank lending market. So there is opportunity, but certainly not to the same extent. And and sounds like the risk-adjusted returns, certainly in the U.S., are really favourable in the debt markets. Um, so we're a little bit like you, Nick. We're we're a, a bit further behind that opportunity, but it it is still there. Look, I think in terms of the equity market and our business is we're just starting out on the debt side, but we've been an equity investor for 15 years and through coming out of the GFC and through cycles. Um, what we focus on is we focus on thematics and trying to be ahead of those other investors in identifying strong thematics. And that goes to real estate fundamentals of demand and supply. And what we see at the moment, particularly in Australia, for a number of reasons, is the residential market is demonstrating really strong fundamentals. Demand is high. We've got strong immigration. We've got foreign students coming back after COVID. And supply is very much constrained. We've all had the shock of construction cost increases. We've got a very complicated planning system. And none of those things can be fixed quickly. So we see over the next five to 10 years, a a real imbalance between the demand supply, which is going to impact both rents and values. Our business does a lot of development and we we do that ourselves and not, not with partners. And the opportunity for us is I would identify in the residential space, matching the right capital, because it is a journey when you develop um, these projects over a period of time, but matching the right capital to opportunities in that res- residential space to produce new product as our market continues to be institutionalized. We're really excited about that opportunity over the medium term. In the US, we've talked a lot about residential. What do you think of those strategies and what other strategies from an equity standpoint do you find interesting coming into 2024? Yeah, uh, in the U.S., we very we think very similarly. I think this is consistent across our entire business globally. We think thematically. We are research informed, and we are drawn by uh, or we're driven by uh, macro themes uh, that exist within our respective markets, and in some instances that exist globally. And it's a real advantage that we have in being able to work together. I would say in the U.S., one of the biggest trends at work is housing affordability household formation and the need for housing for people. Housing affordability is moving in the wrong direction in terms of home ownership. Uh, The population of renters continues to increase. And although supply has increased, rental growth has been very substantial in apartments and in other forms of residential housing pretty consistently over the last 10 years. And we expect that to continue, probably not to the same extent, uh, the same inflationary extent, which I think is unsustainable. But The long story short is people need a place to live and it's harder and harder to be able to buy it. And so we expect that trend to be durable and to continue over time. So that's a macro trend that we believe in. That includes apartments, that includes built to rent single family housing, that might include senior, that might include student, that can uh, include um, debt strategies that support all of the above. And and so we think that's an, an outstanding strategy. Beyond that, the fundamentals of industrial continue to be very good. Retail has been sort of a very strong performer uh, in an under-the-radar fashion since probably third quarter of 2020 as the pandemic began to shake out, and hotel is probably the last one. We have had a lot of uh, success in the hotel area. I think the ability to raise rate every day in the inflationary environment has been beneficial for that asset class, and increased sort of discretionary spending among leisure travelers has been another macro trend. So all of those are the ones I would say. So Nick, that's a big list of opportunities in the U.S. What are you seeing? <laughs> yeah, look, it's 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 a very similar picture. I mean, you know, like my colleagues around the world, we've we've always been structurally focused, for, you know, for more than a decade, and the market reset doesn't really change any of that. You know, it's just it's just creating a new price opportunity. So coming out of the pandemic and with the impacts of inflation and rate volatility, I don't think the fundamentals change. So look, in many ways, I think it's it's kind of like a bittersweet point in the market. I think from my perspective, clearly there are some lots of issues still to navigate as, as this reset goes on. But I think, you know, there's a growing opportunity, which doesn't come around very often. That's the, the sweet part of all of this, isn't it, really? We need we're dealing with issues in our portfolios, but you know you need to put that in perspective and look forward and think about the next cycle and the opportunity that, frankly, we haven't seen for at least a decade. 
So we need to be ready with conviction. That's my my positive spin on the current situation. You know, in, you know, if you have dry powder, and and I know we have a bit of that across our our platform in equity and debt, it's it's a great time to get ready to to make some excess returns. And like John and Al, you know, the industrial all things living, they're both relatively immature within within the European context. So our focus is still going to be in those places. But in the near term, at least, a very near term, I think it's probably more. From my perspective, it's probably less about the sectors and more about the opportunity because over the next 12 months, particularly, is when we expect to see some distress. And and that's really where the focus is, I think, in the near term to generate excess returns. But keeping an eye on those those thematics, of course, as always. So at the end, I'm going to ask you to tell me what vintage year will be the best buying opportunity, 24, 25. So think about that. Right now, we've talked about opportunity. Where are the risks? What's keeping you up at night and why? Alistair, let's go back to you. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned before, we've got quite a, a substantial development activity and, and development book, and it's been it's been a pretty crazy time um, with costs going up 30%. The impact that has on project feasibilities, particularly residential, where a substantial amount of the total cost relates to, relates to the build. Um, and you've got builders that are struggling, uh, some of them going into administration, even some of our bigger ones have filed for administration. We've got a planning system that some would say is, is broken, but it's really challenging to navigate. So it's those things that we try to navigate every day and work very hard. And the, and the key for us is having the right capital partners in those strategies so we can be patient. We can bring them along on the journey. They understand the, uh, the volatility. And if we've got the thematic right, hopefully then the returns will will follow, even though there's a bit of a journey to get there. So that's the the things that keep us up at night and thinking hard as to how to navigate. I'm curious, when you look at some of the risks that you mentioned about the, the strength, the financial strength and wherewithal of the builders, would you or are you considering any operating company investments to take advantage of what you know is a strong builder but might have some financial issues right now that we could support them on and get them back on their feet and obviously produce outside returns i like that idea it sounds sounds good but um look we haven't we haven't thought that that hard about that at this point they're complicated businesses and it can be a bit of a a a murky world so we're partnering with people that we know and we've we've worked with four years and we're doing it in a in a different way we're probably a bit more rigorous on the way in, in in assessing those builders and we're keeping very, very close to them during the process. What we have done in the past and, and what we would do is we, we'd always be in a position where we could step into their shoes should there be that issue. Every time we appoint a builder, we've got a plan if that does eventuate that we can do that. And that goes to the financial management, but as well as being close and understanding the, those projects. Nick, what are you thinking about in terms of risks? What's keeping you up at night? Look, as long as I've got my Jack Reacher novel, nothing keeps me up at night. But look, you know, <laughs> in those rare moments when I do when I do wake from my slumber, look, a couple of things. Look, the re- the refinancing wall we've talked about that's that's obviously a concern. It's a potential destabilizing factor. It's a potential opportunity as well, of course. But you know, it does require banks in Europe, lenders to to meet investors. You know, halfway. You know, to to be to some degree accommodative and flexible, and you know, they a lot. Of, I think a lot of the refinancing, you know, right now is in unfavoured sectors, as we've said. So, and new regulation as well is is obviously a constraint. So that's a concern to me. I think geopolitics. You know, that that's as we've seen over the last few years, that can can knock the best laid plans off target. And you know, looking forward, even over the next twelve months, there are still plenty of flashpoints. To navigate in the near term, and, and and that can have an impact on the recovery we've all been waiting for for so long. So, probably the final thing in Europe, you know, probably a little bit connected to some of the, the points that Al made. I think legislation in Europe has become a growing concern as the, sort of the political cycle matures here. You know, particularly in the residential space. You know, we're, we're now beginning to see societal political pressure on governments to bring in rent controls in in places like the UK, like Spain, where we haven't seen them before. And obviously, in some of these sectors, we we've, we've all been buying into the the fundamentals, which have been supporting rental value growth, which is now potentially under threat. And I think a, not much of that is actually baked into people's business plans. So that's definitely a trend that we're watching really closely. John, what are you worried about? 
356 days till the next election. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I can give you the hours if you like, because that's what keeps me awake. And it's, it's, <laughs> uh, the, the potential for weirdness is high, and weirdness is generally bad for markets. Okay. So I'm getting back to my strongest vintage year for investing. Lightning round. Nick, 24, 25, maybe even 26. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I'm, maybe I've sounded too bullish here. I don't know. But look, it won't surprise you to hear me say 2024. Look, I think that's going to be the year of maximum opportunity. And if you're going to wait until 2025, you're probably missing some of the best deals in Europe. So we're certainly gearing up for next year. John, what about the US? I'd probably say 2025 if I had to guess. My first answer is if I knew the answer to that question, I'd be a seer, but uh, I, I think I think that transaction volume is really going to be somewhat slow to play out. And so I think that I'm inclined to think it's 2025. I think 2024 could be terrific as well. It's just a question of you know how long does a fund take to get up and running from a vintage standpoint. If you could raise money immediately, the best opportunity may well come in 2024. And Al, what do you think? Well, I'm going to split the difference. I think um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're we're focused on investing heavily through the bottom quartile of, of of the cycle and and probably 24 25 is is going to be that so and to john's point at the beginning i think getting the right investments at the right time is really important and but asset management development management is going to be really important in delivering on those strategies so yeah we'd love to see 20 24 and 25 i think a couple of good years and set us up for the next for the medium term well, someone told me early in my career, people always say for real estate, success is location, 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 but it's really timing, 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 and I hope we get it right. One last question. What's one bold prediction, and I'm highlighting bold for 2024, and I'm going to start to take a little pressure off you guys. My prediction is Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey will be engaged by the end of 2024. So, I kind of like that. And I, I'm Nick. willing to take that bet, and I'm also Look. willing to take the bet that that engagement does not last through 2024. Yeah. <laughs> <How's that sound? laughs> we'll, we'll go both ways, and if we're specific okay. in that, then we ought to be wagering. But I'll I'll go next, Maureen. You've inspired me. Um, bold prediction for 2024 from me is that the 10-year uh, Treasury remains in the fours, and that everyone gets peace with the concept that that's where it's going to stay, and it's not such a bad thing for real estate. All right, John, I'm writing it down. Yeah, it's probably not a bold prediction, but I think we'll have some interest rate cuts in in 2024, particularly in the US. Maybe not in Australia. We seem to be uh, behind on everything, but I, I do think we will have some cuts. I won't even go to the prediction around the election that you mentioned, John. I, I'd be interested in that, but that'll probably take a bit longer than, than we've got. So uh, yeah, that's a prediction for me. Yeah, and for me, look on the interest rate theme. I think yeah, we will we will see a fall probably in Q3 in Europe. In, in fact, I'm going to be bold and say we'll probably see three 25 bips cuts by the end of the year at least. So you can write that one down as well, Maureen. On a lighter note, I'm probably I have to back England to win the Euros in 2024 in Germany. Um, that's soccer for for my colleagues in the US. So yeah, that's my very very bold prediction for for 24. It's coming home. Thanks, everybody, for your predictions for 2024. I think we have time for one question, and, I'm, and it's coming in for the entire group. The question is, how has the definition of core real estate changed, and how do you see core fitting into your diversified real estate portfolios? Um, Al, would you mind starting us off on answering that question for the audience? Sure, sure. Look, I, I think that for us, the definition of core real estate probably hasn't changed a lot. I think it's an important part of our market and an important part of investors' allocation to real estate. I think the the returns in respect of what one would expect out of core have changed and they're tied to the 10-year bond rate and, and a premium to that, whether that's 2 to 4%. I think what's really important in the core space is, is getting that sector allocation right and, and again, following the right themes and you know, being in those right parts of the core, right parts of the sectors um, will deliver outperformance. Nick, how are you thinking about the definition of core these days? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe answer it in a slightly different way. So I think, I mean, I think the definition always varies through the cycle as, as you know, core criteria sort of loosen and tighten and, and tighten according to the risk environment. But I think 
from my perspective, I think probably the biggest change is probably in the shape of the investable universe when I look at, you know, that today relative to when I started my career. So, you know, maybe, maybe back then, 20, 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago, 50% of a, a typical core investor portfolio would have been retail. Probably 30, 35% would have been office with the balance as, as industrial and, you know, the amorphous other. Because residential, you know, hasn't really been an investable or an institutional asset class for most, in most jurisdictions in Europe, with one or two in- exceptions. But if we look at it today, obviously that's completely changed. We've had the sort of the structural rollout of retail with the impact of e-commerce. We've, we're now seeing similar sort of structural change in the office sector, or at least the fear of that structural change. And and in Europe, you know, all things living and industrial logistics have, have, have sort of have moved up as well. So the, the shape of, of a typical core portfolio is completely different. So I can't think of a bigger change than that. The other thing, of course, is the rise of ESG and sustainability, you know, that in Europe, at least, is probably the biggest single core criteria that people look to first when they're assessing an asset and its value and its and its potential. So, so those are probably the two things I'd point to. But but like Al, I'd say, look, I don't, I don't fundamentally believe that that real estate is threatened as a diversifier for asset allocators. I still think it has that it still has that role. You know, it, it can reduce volatility, it can produce better risk adjusted returns, and and for that that reason, I. I don't see long-term allocations to the sector, at least, you know, reducing significantly. And John, can you give us your thoughts? Yeah, I'll say the common prevailing wisdom in the States today is that office will exit as a core asset class or largely exit as a core asset class. And that alternative asset, what were alternative asset classes such as storage or manufactured housing or other specialized asset classes will emerge and fill uh, the gap that is left by office. I would say I agree, kind of. I think that uh, office is, is less of a core asset class, but I think it's a mistake to say that there are not core office assets on a look forward basis. I think that's an overreaction, which we're great at in business generally, in the real estate business specifically. I think that there is a place in a core portfolio for a, a well-built, well-maintained, well-leased office building in the kinds of locations that are attractive to young talent. I absolutely think that core will adapt uh, and uh, and their office will represent a smaller percentage of the whole. But I think I look at retail and say, retail probably has a place in core portfolios. And if you asked people in April of 2020, if that would be the case, I think the answer would have been a very broad no. But I think what we've seen is that outside of malls and really a subset of malls, the retail has actually been a pretty good performer and has performed as you would hope it would in a core portfolio, particularly grocery anchored retail. So so as not to indulge overreaction, I will say office remains a part of core, but smaller and more esoteric asset classes become a greater piece of the whole. Yeah, and John, just to just to jump in there, in case um you think I was saying office isn't core, I completely agree with you. I you know. I wouldn't confuse the structural shift that we've seen in retail with what I expect is going to play out in office, which, you know, cl- clearly we, you know, we have a cyclical and a structural repricing to move through in the office space. But ultimately, yes, you know, there are going to be, there are going to be core offices. There are core offices today for sure, uh, which just seeing a development in the market and, and, you know, in the near term, probably an, an overreaction to the hybrid working trend, but, but there's, def- there's, there's definitely a future for office space. And while we're here, I'm going to throw one hot take, and that is that core is an underappreciated asset class today. And I would not be shocked if over the next 24 months, we saw a window of opportunity to enter that space and to secure core assets that you'll be happy with for a generation. Well, thanks, guys. It looks like we're at the end of the time, but I want to thank everybody who submitted questions and who joined us today. If we didn't get to yours, please reach out to your bearings representative, and we'll continue the conversation with you. Finally, and as always, we thank you for your confidence in bearings and your continued partnership with us. Thanks for listening to this episode of Streaming Income. If you'd like to stay up to date on our latest thoughts on asset classes ranging from high yield and private credit to real estate debt and equity, make sure to follow us and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. 
We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and more. We publish a new episode every other week. And if you have specific feedback, you can email us at podcast at bearings.com. That's podcast at B-A-R-I-N-G-S.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.